Hello to all the youth and young adults gathered from around the country for this uh, virtual national youth event. My name is John Dorhauer, and in 2015, I was elected to serve as the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ, one of the most exciting and engaging organizations anywhere in the world, and I am proud to have been called to serve as their general minister and president. And you should be proud to claim to be a part of the rich history and tradition that is the United Church of Christ. In this workshop, I'm going to talk just briefly uh, a little bit about myself so you get to know me a little bit and then much more broadly about the United Church of Christ and why I'm proud to be a part of it and why I think you should be proud to be a part of it. Towards the end of the video, some of you have sent in uh, videotapes of questions that you'd like answered and we'll play those and I'll answer them. I just wanna thank all of you for participating in this year's National Youth Event. We're sorry that we couldn't gather together. It would have been an incredible experience, but so will this be. And we are learning new ways to be the church in this virtual environment. And you're a part of groundbreaking history as we unfold this. So sit back for a few minutes and in, I hope you enjoy the workshop that I'm about to present. I was born on June 28th, 1961. I was the second of seven children with an older sister. All of the siblings that would follow, all five of them would be brothers. I was born in St. Louis and raised to be a diehard Cardinal fan. And in a few seconds or a few minutes, you'll see a video that demonstrates how crazy Cardinal I am. I was raised Catholic, and it was my dream at the end of my grade school years that I would go on to be ordained into the Catholic priesthood. You'll hear more about that in a second. My childhood was a happy one. Played a lot of baseball, had a lot of kids in the neighborhood that we would play with, Almost had a full baseball team with my siblings, but not quite, and we had a lot of fun growing up together. We remained very close through the years. I went to high school and in high school entered the seminary. Played soccer there, was captain of the soccer team, was on the speech team, and graduated at the top of my class, was fairly intelligent. Went from there to continue my seminary years until I met my wife, Mimi. Mimi and I were married on June 16th, 36 years ago. And we became parents to three of the most beautiful children, John, Adam, and the third, our daughter, Molly. They're all grown now. Molly is the baby at 31, and having been married 36 years, our sons are 34 and 35 years old themselves. I became ordained into the United Church of Christ in 1988. I've been serving in ministry now for 32 years and consider it to be a great joy, a great honor, and a great pleasure. And in 2015, I was elected to serve as the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. We have two grandchildren, Jacob and Elizabeth. My name is John. A few seconds ago, you heard me talk about being a diehard Cardinal fan, and this is just a short video of me wearing and displaying all of the jerseys, jackets, and hats that I currently own. Now, what's about to follow will be a series of four short videos, each about five minutes in length, in which I take a saying, a well-known saying from the history of the United Church of Christ, and use that to talk a little bit about what I think are some of the core values of the United Church of Christ. Hopefully by the end of that, you'll get some sense about uh, why I am so proud to be a part of this denomination. 
The first saying is actually the motto of the United Church of Christ that comes to us from the Gospel of John. And it's a short verse, and it reads simply that they may all be one. A bit of background on this passage. It comes to us in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel. Uh, the 17th chapter is telling us a story about what happened on the night that Jesus died. And that story actually opens up all the way back in the 14th chapter, which means that John's going to spend the 14th chapter, the 15th chapter, the 16th chapter, and the 17th chapter just talking about that night. Throughout the whole thing, Basically, what we get is kind of a recording of what Jesus was doing to teach his disciples, knowing that he was going to die the next day, he was going to rise again, but after that, he was going to send them out to preach the good news to all the ends of the earth and literally spread the gospel, trying to build what we now know to be the church. But when we get to chapter 17, verse number 21, where it reads that they may all be one, Jesus stops teaching. And he starts praying. And he prays by saying this. I ask, dear God, not on behalf of those gathered in this room tonight, but on behalf of all who would come to believe in my word because of their proclamation. And then he's going to offer this prayer that they may all be one. It's a prayer for us, those of us who call ourselves disciples, those of us who are literally among those who came to believe because of the preaching and teaching of the disciples. And what did he ask? What did he pray for? That they may all be one. Why? Of all of the things that Jesus, on the night before he was to die, could pray for, for his followers, for the church, why this? And I think it's pretty simple. Jesus had had his fill of hypocrites, people who say one thing and do something else. Jesus had had his fill of those who talked about love but couldn't demonstrate it. That's hypocrisy. And Jesus knew that if these people were going to go around and change lives and change the world by preaching and teaching about love but couldn't demonstrate their love for one another, nobody would believe them. This whole gospel enterprise, this whole church thing would be ruined from the start by a group that couldn't get along with one another. And so what was his prayer? That they may all be one. This wasn't the kind of unity that required that we all think the same way or believe the same things. It was a unity that believed that in spite of who you are, because of who you are, you belong here. And no matter what you think or what you believe, no matter what you've done or where you've been, you have a place at the table. And that's the only way this works. If the people going out trying to change the world by talking about the power of love and the power of God's love couldn't love one another, then nobody was going to buy what they were selling. And so, as the 20th century rolled around and church leaders began to wake up at the end of the period of enlightenment and modernity and realize that we had just separated the church into so many pieces nobody even recognized it anymore. There were Lutherans and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Unitarians and yada, yada, yada. Somebody woke up and said, you know what? I think Jesus was serious when he said that they may all be one. And a global effort to bring the body back together formed and became known as the United and Uniting Movement. And there are now 64 united and uniting communions around the world. The first, our neighbors to the north, with whom we have a full communion partnership, was the United Church of Canada, which formed in 1925. We would come a few years later when in 1957, four different denominations, the Evangelical, the Reformed, the Christian, and the Congregational came together and in the spirit of what Jesus intended on that night he prayed, became one and chose as their motto that they may all be one. That is the United Church of Christ. The next thing I want to talk to you about is uh, a saying that I remember hearing a number of years ago that struck me as uh, deep and profound and really at the core of how we practice our faith in the United Church of Christ. And the only way I know of to really live into this that they may all be one kind of being. So the saying goes like this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. 
in all things charity. So let me unpack that for a minute. Again, I think this is at the core of what it means to create church reflective of what Jesus intended when he talked about that they may all be one. Now, one asks for unity. And so the first part of this, uh, this saying actually does call for unity. In essentials, unity. Now, we're going to disagree about a lot, but there are a few things that we have to agree on but only the essentials. So this is a way of being church, which has things that we're gonna hold on to no matter what, no matter what changes, no matter what you believe. And if we can't agree on these, we really aren't a part of the body of Christ. Our preamble to the Constitution reads, and there's a line in our Constitution that says that the sole head of the church is Jesus. That's an essential. We can't be a part of the body of Christ and we can't be the United Church of Christ if that essential isn't held by all. Jesus is the sole head of the church. Well, what's interesting is that as we live into our way of being in the United Church of Christ, we can argue and we do about what are the essentials. What are the things that have to hold in order for us to be who we are? I think a second has evolved over the time over time I'm not sure that it was always this way or that it was always lived as fully as it is today by the way I'm out front so you're gonna hear cars passing by that is no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey you're welcome here this has come to be an essential in the United Church of Christ so in essentials unity we're gonna be one on these matters and Whatever is on that list has to be agreed to by all. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. Non-essentials are those things that we can have flexibility on because to change these doesn't change our identity, doesn't change our mission. It helps us be more fully who we are by living these matters out and debating them. And this is what we love to do in the United Church of Christ. So in non-essentials, liberty. Do we actually believe in the United Church of Christ that all people should be open to a pro-choice point of view? It's not an essential. You can be a Christian without believing that women have the right to choose. Now, I happen to be one that does believe in a woman's right to choose, but not doing so doesn't disqualify you from what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And again, one of my favorite things about the United Church of Christ is that with this liberty, people of varying points of view can come together and have discussions and arguments with one another. And they don't have to leave the room agreeing with one another. That's where the liberty comes in. We do have to leave the room loving one another, and that's where the unity comes in. So in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, love. One could argue that's another essential, and we will be one in this, that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here and you will be loved here. That no matter what belief you hold or how steadfastly you maintain it in the face of those who disagree, you will be loved. And all that we ask of you is that you love in return. In what matters do we extend love to one another? In all matters. So once again, a core part of the United Church of Christ is believing in essentials, unity. In not essentials, liberty. In all things, love. The next thing I want to talk about comes to us from the relationship that we have with the one we call God. There's a passage in Isaiah that gives us an insight into this particular character of God's, and it reads, Behold, I'm about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Congregationalists were starting the Reformation in England, they were persecuted. 
the Reformation was their new thing. They had grown a little weary of the way church was being forced upon them, and the human community was beginning to express and articulate a desire for a little more latitude and freedom. And so a part of that is the birth of the Reformation, and there was a Reformation in England. Because of the persecution they felt there, there were a group of English uh, congregationalists who wanted to explore the freedom of their religion in another, in another place, and they set forth on the Mayflower. And as they left their church in Scrooby, England, and boarded the ship to leave, the pastor, John Robinson, looked at them and said, there is yet and still more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word. That was a way of saying God's about to do a new thing. God has always done a new thing, and don't be surprised by that. And so the Congregationalists were the first of the four strands to become the United Church of Christ that actually landed in the United, what is now the United States, and they had that mentality about them. Behold, I'm about to do a, do a new thing. There is yet still more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word. When the abolitionist movement started up, there were a number of people from the congregational and the Christian and even the evangelical and reform side who became very active in the abolitionist movement. And an abolitionist poet by the, names of, by the name of James Russell Lowell wrote a poem called The Present Crisis in which he said in full fashion of the United Church of Christ, in, in fashion of the prophet Isaiah and John Robinson, that we must onwards still and upwards who would keep abreast of truth. Things are always changing. Remembering this, when the United Church Christ of Christ came to be, one of the things that we adopted was the call for each generation to make the faith its own. Those of you who have gone through confirmation have affirmed your faith. We taught you the roots and the traditions and the heritage and what has been, not to say to you, now you go perpetuate this, but to give you a sense of who we are so that for your generation, you could recreate a church and a way of being church that met your needs. Each generation would create the faith in its own way. Yeah. God is about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? There is yet and still more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word, and we must onward still and upwards who would keep abreast of truth. We have come to say that a little differently now in the United Church of Christ. One second here. We refer to this God whom we have come to know in this way as the still speaking God. And as youth and young adults active in this national youth event and exploring your role in life in the United Church of Christ, we want you to hear that God is still speaking and that you have the responsibility that all of the generations that preceded you had to discover what is the new thing God is doing. What is the still speaking God saying to you? And your exploration of that is you participating in a long history of a way of being church that the United Church of Christ owns, loves, and appreciates. So we ask you, what is God saying to you? What are you hearing as you grow in to your faith? And what is it you want and need the church to be for your generation? God is still speaking and is about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? There's one more line from the United Church of Christ, the most recent of all of them, that I want to talk to you about. Why don't you come for a little walk with me down the street? So this last line actually comes from the, a mission statement, a mission, vision, and purpose statement. statement. Uh, written by the United Church of Christ and affirmed by their board of directors a little over three years ago. The vision statement answers the question, what does the United Church of Christ see in the world if it completes its mission? And this is what they said. It's a 
short phrase, but it's a powerful one. And the phrase is, they see a just world for all. That encapsulates what has been 400 years of dynamic leadership by the United Church of Christ, always actively engaged in the social justice movements of their time. And always because of that, fomenting dissent and conflict and tension. Because in matters of social justice, the world doesn't change quickly or easily and always puts up a fight. The fight usually being maintained by those who hold power. The United Church of Christ is often because of this called a radical church. Well, I like to say we're not radical, we're just early. We were early when in the 1830s, we became the first US church to ordain a black man. We were early when just a couple of decades later, we became the first church in the United States to ordain a woman. We were early when in the 1970s, decades ahead of anybody else, we ordained the first gay man. We weren't radical, we were early. And throughout our history, the call to justice has been perceived not as a radical act, but as an act consistent of a church dedicated to the proclamation of a gospel that teaches that no matter who you are or where you are, you're welcome here. A gospel that believes that the highest value that we can maintain for, with, and between each other is love. After all, it was Jesus who said the entire law can be summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but love your neighbor as yourself. Justice is what is required of us. Justice is what is asked of us. And it is embodying our love of Jesus in acts of kindness and compassion to humanity, especially those who exist for far too long on the margins of our society and who are not afforded the, the pleasures of life, the rights that, of citizens that others are more easily. Of late, in the United States, as a part of the way of the United Church of Christ living out its call to justice, we have been engaged in the role of women in the church, the role of women in society, the rights of the LGBTQI plus community, including becoming the first religious body anywhere in the world to affirm marriage equality. And for that reason, within five years, seeing the entire, within a decade, I'm sorry, within a decade, seeing the entire United Church of Christ become a marriage equality country. And certainly in these days, the ongoing struggle for racial justice. We do these things not in spite of what the Bible teaches us, which some of your friends and even maybe some of your family, like mine, will argue is inconsistent with what they read in the Bible. And they say that we do this in spite of that. No, we don't do any of this work of justice in spite of what the Bible says to us. We do it precisely because of what we see in the Bible. And we believe, and we articulate this fully in the United Church of Christ, that our faith requires no less of us. That to not commit to this work of justice would be to do the work of love poorly and inadequately. And so what it means to be the United Church of Christ, it means to embody the love of neighbor in acts of kindness, compassion, and justice long before the world is ready to hear the words of justice. We're not radical, we're early. And our faith is consistent with everything we believe about Jesus and the gospel. Hey, Dr. Dora Howard, my name is Chantel Armstead. I am from Current Chapel United Church of Christ from Suffolk, Virginia in the Southern Conference. And my question to you is, what makes the United Church of Christ united other than its name? Thank you. Hi, Chantel, and thank you for the question. What makes the United Church of Christ United in more than just name is, well, let's start with the origins. In 1957, four denominations came together, the Congregational, the Christian, the Evangelical, and the Reformed. They literally united. We're one of 64 
united in uniting communions around the world, which means that in 64 other countries around the world, various denominations left behind their singular past to form a shared future with other denominations. So that's one of the things that makes us a united church. But I would say that there are other things as well. We are united in the belief that all are welcome. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. We are united in the belief that you don't have to agree with all of the teachings of your church, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, members of your family. What makes us one and what creates our unity isn't a singularity of belief, but a multiplicity of ideas and the promise that despite our disagreeing with one another, we'll come to a common table. And so even though every Sunday when we gather, there are a variety of thoughts, opinions, and beliefs, there is only one table. And that's the other thing that binds us together. That table where we gather, that table where we share the sacrament of bread and wine, all are welcome at that table. That's another thing that unifies us. And so we are united in many things other than just the name United Church of Christ. Thank you. A good question. Hi, my name is Garrison Case, and I'm from First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And my question for you about life in the UCC is how do you decide on what stance to take for political or social issues in the United States? Garrison, I want to thank you for your question. Uh, it's a really important one. How we decide what political stances that we're going to take in any given time. There are a variety of responses to that. Let's start with the big one. Uh, General Synod is an event held every two years where delegates from every conference gather from across the country. Somewhere around 670 to 700 delegates will show up and vote. And one of the things they'll do while they're together for a whole week is cast a vote on resolutions of public witness. And once those resolutions of public witness pass, it means that the officers and the employees of the national setting must speak in the voice of general sitting. Some of those resolutions have been uh, calling for marriage equality, uh, calling for reproductive rights for women, calling for racial justice, and on and on and on. When Synod votes, then the national setting of the United Church of Christ is obliged to speak out for justice on their behalf. Just a, something to make note here. General Synod only speaks to the United Church of Christ. It doesn't speak for it. So the only covenant partner obligated to speak when Synod acts is are those who work in the national setting. Local churches and clergy and conferences and associations are free to make up their own mind about it. They must take seriously the actions of a general synod, but they're not bound by them the way that the national setting is. But there are a variety of other ways that we come together and choose to act in, on, in behalf of social justice. Uh, we have a United Church of Christ board, which according to the Constitution is general synod ad interim in the meantime and the board can vote to take actions. But the officers of the United Church of Christ and those who work in the national setting can certainly take a look at the rich history of the United Church of Christ and see that some of the actions that we have taken in the past are consistent with what's required of us today. And therefore, we can act on our own in ways that we believe are consistent with the actions of the church in the past. Given all of that, whether we're talking about General Synod, whether we're talking about the officers, whether we're talking about the board, or whether we're talking about local churches and clergy trying to make up their own mind, there really is one source. And that's God revealed to us in Scripture, in the life, words, ministry, and teachings of Jesus, and the rich history of the church. All of those speak to us about a church in action and a people called to justice. And so in consultation with scripture, through
through prayer, through dialogue with uh, leaders in the current church and leaders in the past who speak to us through their writings and their actions, we make decisions about what justice actions to take and stand for. Thanks, Garrison. That is a very good question. My name is Avery Lapis. I go to Center Church in South Hadley, Massachusetts. And my question is, what is the most important thing you have learned throughout your time in the UCC? And how do you use that in your job, in your daily life? Hi, Avery. It's good to see you. And thank you for the question. It's really a good one. So what have I learned? What's the most important thing I've learned since becoming general minister and president? I'm going to actually name two things. Um, the first is you can't do anything alone. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how resourceful you are. I don't care how much of a budget you have, um, how much experience you've had, how much education you've had. You can't do anything alone. And so one of the things that we try to emphasize in working here in the national setting is collaboration and, and covenant, working together. We, like, we live in what I like to call an interdependent world. We need each other. And I happen to be surrounded by some of the most talented, passionate, intelligent, gifted leaders that the church has ever produced here in the national setting. And it is an extraordinarily uh, rich opportunity for me to serve in the national setting. Um, and so the first thing that I would say about what I've learned is you've got to have partners. And the other thing I'll add to that is once you find that talent, get out of their way. Let them do what God gave them the gift to do and what they were called here to do. The second thing is you've got to be able to and willing to stand up to resistance. If you're going to lead, and especially if you're going to lead through a time of change, you have to be willing to listen to people say, I'm not so sure that's the right thing to do. You have to be able to stand in the face of, of anger and grief as those changes come. But as long as you believe that what you're doing is going to make the organization and the church and the denomination and the world and your community a better place, then when the resistance comes, stay true. Stay true to your dreams, your hopes, your visions, your plans, your strategies, your expectations. It's not going to be easy. And it doesn't mean you're always going to be right. But don't give in when that first sort of resistance and tension and conflict arises. It's pretty natural and you're going to be okay through it. So thank you, Avery, for the question. And uh, I wish... We were all together and we could spend some time with each other, but this is a virtual event and it's all working out okay. This is Sam Ringel from the United Church of so Midland in Midland, Lake, Michigan, and his voice and recording didn't work, so I'm going to ask this question for him. He asks, what are the advantages and disadvantages of autonomy in the United Church of Christ? Thank you, Sam, for your question. What I really like about this, it shows a level of mature understanding and nuanced understanding of the United Church of Christ. Autonomy is such an important piece of the way the United Church of, of Christ has chosen to be church. Remember, a part of our birth narrative is that we were formed in the cauldron of reformation that swept across the European continent in the 16th century. When the church was trying to wrestle and free itself uh, from uh, a, a kind of hierarchical power that dictated how those who were active in the church would behave and what they would believe. And so when the Reformation birthed a new way of being church, one of the things that an articulation of the Reformation asked for and, and fought for was the right for those who were believers and baptized and confirmed to have a say in the development of their own faith and their own faith journey. And it also argued that the local church was the place for that deliberation and for that education to primarily be located. They didn't want somebody from outside the influence of the local church telling a member of that church what they can and cannot do and what they should or should not believe. And so, from that history came the concept of autonomy, 
being free from a hierarchical structure, power, or authority that dictated and mandated down the chain what people could and couldn't do and what they had and didn't and could not believe. Fast forward to 1957 when the Congregational Christian Churches, two churches that had already merged, were looking to partner with and merge with an Evangelical and Reformed Church. Now, the Evangelical and Reformed Church believed heavily in covenant, in binding with one another and making decisions together that all would own, and even having a little bit of what we would identify as a hierarchical structure and trust in authority that may be above and beyond you whereas the Congregational Christian side still held to that notion that it was a local church that made those decisions and where the power resided. That made it very challenging for those two entities to actually find and discover their new unity. And so what they did was argue on the one hand for the autonomy of the local church and on the other hand for the covenant responsibility to stay in relationship with those with whom you disagree and to trust those who have authority over you. You don't have to do what they say, but you do have to take seriously and covenant what you hear them say. Some of the advantages of autonomy are that it frees up the church to take bold new steps and actions, and they don't have to wait for the entire institution to change to get there. And so if we go to 1972, when the church was deliberating about whether or not it can or should ordain a gay man, it was an association autonomously created on the West Coast that laid hands on Bill Johnson and ordained him long before the hierarchical structure of the institution was willing to change. Autonomy is so important for any organization that wants to constantly move forward and change with the voice of a still speaking God that is always asking us to, as we said earlier, do new things. But there are some disadvantages. I once worked with a church that I thought was about to make a bad decision about its pastor. I thought they were going to call a pastor that wasn't really um, the kind of leader that they wanted and needed. And they ignored that advice, and within six months I was going down to resolve high levels of conflict as they discovered both the pastor and the church that they were not a good match for one another. And as I sat and listened to them talk about, they were angry, as I sat and listened to them talk about their anger around that, they basically asked how I could let this happen. And I said, this is the nature of autonomy. And somebody even asked me how we could keep that from happening again, and I said, make me a bishop. As a bishop, I could tell you who your pastor is going to be, but until then, you have to live with the consequences of any bad decisions that you make. And so there are times when having a hierarchical structure might be an advantage. So, uh, Sam, I really want to thank you for the question. I wish we had more time to go into what I think is a really important question, but that gives you some idea of advantages and disadvantages. Hi, Reverend Dorhauer. My name is Solano Postma. I go to Manistee First Congregational UCC Church in Manistee, Michigan. And my question for you is, how is the UCC serving a role in stopping the climate crisis? Thank you. Hi, Solana, and thank you for your question. I think you ask about what may be the most important justice issue of our time, climate crisis. I've been saying for quite some time that if we fail to solve this issue, it will solve every other justice issue for us. Meaning that all of the problems that we have as human beings on earth uh, could be wiped out if the human race as we know it can no longer exist on the planet. It's a very serious matter. And the United Church of Christ is very actively involved in um, environmental justice. A few things. Um, over 40 years ago, the United Church of Christ authored an historic document that wrote about and uncovered what we call environmental racism. And it was a report written by Ben Chavis, who was a leader in the United Church of Christ at that time, and a group that he put together. And one of the things they discovered is that when toxic waste is collected and dumped, it's usually dumped in and around um, areas where there are high densities of, of populations of color and racial minorities and lower class poor people living. That's environmental racism. And on Earth Day of this year in April, 
um, our current environmental justice minister, Brooks Barrett, issued a, a update of that document and told the story of environmental racism in our time. The United Church of Christ has been engaged for over three years in a campaign called Three Great Loves. In fact, I have a stole right here hanging on my wall that is a design of Three Great Loves. And the Three Great Loves are love of neighbor, love of children, and love of creation. Now, those really could be a lot of different things, but we believe in our time that those three things are just crying out for our attention. And so one of the areas that we're focusing on in our Three Great Loves campaign is the love of creation. And we're asking our churches everywhere, how do you embody God's love by caring for creation? It is a direct call to our churches to actively engage in love of nature, love of creation, and to be good stewards of the earth entrusted to us by God our Creator. So, Lana, I want to thank you. Again, it was an incredibly important question about what is, I think, the greatest justice issue of our time. Thanks. Well, that was my workshop. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I certainly had fun putting this together. I hope you had some fun and maybe learned some things along the way. In closing, I just want to thank all of you for your participation in the National Youth Event. I want to thank you for being the leaders that you are in your churches and communities. I want to wish you the best in whatever the future holds for you. This has been fun. I'm John Dorhauer, General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. Thanks.